of Augustine has gone a long, long way. I remember starting working in, um, in the area of hypertension almost 45 years ago. It's a long, long time ago. And at that time, the measurement of aldosterone was very, very difficult. I caught the tail end of what was called the double isotopic uh, method to measure uh, cortisol, uh, I mean aldosterone, the method that you can measure about 10 samples a week after working very, very hard. It was very difficult. With the advent of the red immunoassay, uh, which I published the third ever method in 1973, we have gone a long way. It was a difficult assay to do at the time because of the quality of antibodies, but things have improved very, very dramatically. And in the last few years, with a tremendous uh, advance with respect to the diagnosis of primary aldosteronism, recognizing that primary aldosteronism is a very, very common disorder, probably occurring somewhere, depend on what kind of clinic you are, somewhere between maybe 2% or up to 10 or 15% of your population, it has become a very, very important diagnosis to try to establish. And the newer methods, and one of the methods that's being described uh, today uh, uh, is, is a significant advance in our ability to measure accurately. Because if you look, I was part of the consensus conference on the diagnosis of primary aldosteronism, and one of the big problems is to try to establish specific levels. And some of the methods, uh, yes, had wide variations in, in the reliability. I think that's a significant advance. And we have two outstanding speakers, both of what I've met before. Uh, Martin Bittlinger is from Munich. Uh, at least he's at the University of Munich. I'm sorry, my German is terrible. But um, I met Martin a few years ago in, in Munich and collaborated in the development of an assay for mice some years ago. Uh, excellent, using an antibody that I developed more than two decades ago. And he has done excellent work and has been working in the area of aldosterone for many, many years now and, um, in a group that is highly interested in this area. And then Dan Holmes that I met just a couple of years ago in, in Vancouver, and I was extremely impressed by the equipment and the way they were running the equipment in the measurement of our aldosterone and aldosterone, which as you know is in, in such a low concentration that it's very, very difficult to measure. And with much ado, our first speaker, I believe, is Martin Bittlinger. Thank you very much, Chelsea. Thanks to all for coming. Um, before I'm going to explain something about the new aldosterone and renin assays, which run both analytes in an automated way on, a, on a, um, the IDS system, I want to um, touch some of the points Chelsea already mentioned in the introduction. I will briefly try to make clear why we must screen for primary aldosteronism. Second, um, I will describe the guidelines how to screen for, for aldosteronism. Then I will um, um, illustrate some of the horrible problems we have with the standardization of assays. In my role as the um, endocrine advisor of the German External Quality Assessment Scheme for Laboratories, I have the pleasure, I don't want to um, call it a pleasure, I, I, I have to review the data four times a year and the discrepancies between the assays are really still horrible. Um, after that introduction I will go to um, more specific data on the new assays um, we validated on the ISIS system and also uh, I will present some data from a huge clinical cohort we investigated to establish um, cutoffs for the aldosterone to renin ratio and for, for salt load testing. Um, why to screen for primary aldosteronism? The answer is very simple. First, it's a frequent cause of hypertension. Second, patients affected with this cause of hypertension have a more severe illness, have a higher morbidity, 
and mortality than other patients with essential hypertension. And finally, it's good to know a patient has primary aldosteronism because specific treatment is available. Um, when I went to medical school, I learned that CON syndrome is a very rare entity, somewhere below 1% of the patients affected. Um, in the meantime, the picture has completely changed. Um, one of the early studies um, illustrated nicely that the prevalence of aldosteronism is higher if the hypertension has a um, higher stage. So in this study, it was up to 13% of the patients screened with stage 3 hypertension. Um, in another study, it was also um, clearly demonstrated that with the more resistant forms of hypertension, the diagnosis of primary aldosteronism is much more likely. Again, in this study, somewhere between 15 and 20%. And a very recent review this year um, summarized several studies uh, which have been conducted in various countries. And again, they, the authors found um, that in the different publications, quite high. Um, second, second, second. This one? I can't see. Yeah. Um, again, the authors found that in, in many different cohorts the uh, prevalence of primary aldosteronism was somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. It's important to mention, of course, these are patients with resistant hypertension. Okay. Ah, yeah. okay. These are patients with resistant hypertension. It's not every patient with hypertension who has been screened in these studies. Um, but in the case of um, resistant hypertension, the likelihood to identify a patient with primary aldosteronism is very high. Um, in contrast, and that's very important to keep in mind, hypokalemia is not a frequent event. Hypokalemia is not a prerequisite to make the diagnosis of uh, primary aldosteronism. In this study, it could be clearly shown that in the adenomas, it's somewhere about 50%, but in the uh, hyperplasia type of primary aldosteronism, it's below 20% where you can find hypokalemia. So you miss a lot of patients if you only screen those for primary aldosteronism which have hypokalemia. The morbidity, this is data from the German SCONS registry we established um, about eight years ago. Um, the morbidity is increasing with increasing aldosterone levels. Um, and it's not only the case in Germany, there are studies from other countries. And um, in this study, it was compared the um, cardiovascular events and, and uh, structural changes uh, were compared between primary aldosteronism and essential hypertension. And as you can see, in all the parameters, um, the patients with primary aldosteronism had a more severe disease, more stroke, more infarction um, than patients with essential hypertension. So it's really important to identify those patients. Question how to screen for primary aldosteronism and uh, we are in the lucky position to have the guidelines from the Endocrine Society um, where a clear algorithm um, has been developed and uh, is recommended. And the first point to screen is um, through the aldosterone to renin ratio, which can be done from a single blood sample. Um, it's important uh, to use the aldosterone to renin ratio because it's more sensitive than the measurement of each analyte um, alone. Um, this has also been illustrated in a, in a study from Berlin a couple of years ago. As you can see, regardless whether you are measuring plasma aldosterone concentration, plasma renin activity or plasma renin concentration, we always observe a considerable overlap between healthy subjects and those affected with aldosteronism. But if we go to the aldosterone to renin ratio, 
so slightly elevated aldosterone and slightly suppressed renin, we get a much better separation of the two entities. Good. Um, if you start screening for primary aldosteronism, um, you should be prepared that you will detect a lot of more patients than before screening. This was nicely illustrated by uh, Mulatero and colleagues in this international multi-center study. Um, if you look at the frequency of the diagnosis, the number of cases in each center before and after the introduction of the aldosterone to renin ratio, it becomes obvious you identify a lot more patients than if you are screening with the aldosterone to renin ratio. We also made the same observation in, in our hospital, in, in University Hospital in Munich. And over the last 10 years, I think the numbers went up by, we have 10 times higher numbers than before. Good. Um, I hope I, I was able to illustrate why it's important to look for this disease. Um, I also referred to the guidelines saying we should screen using the aldosterone to renin ratio. Um, running an endocrine laboratory now, I also have to uh, point to some of the pitfalls we have. Um, this is an example from the uh, external quality assessment. Um, in Germany, 136 laboratories are participating, measuring aldosterone with a couple of methods. And um, as you can see, the, or the scheme um, functions like this. We have two samples, A and B, and each laboratory is measuring aldosterone in both samples, so each dot represents one laboratory. And the overall variability for the A sample was almost 40%, and it was more than 20% for the B sample. And if you go into more detail and you look at specific methods used to measure aldosterone, um, you can see that you um, find distinct clusters. For example, the Siemens radioimmunoassay, the labs using this assay are in this range, the beckmann radio radioimmunoassay laboratories are in this range, um, the gold standard for us is uh, um, liquid chromatography mass spec method um, performed by the Reference Institute for Bioanalytics in Bonn um, in Germany and this is the target value and you can s easily uh, see that some of the methods <laughs> luckily meet the target more or less and others are completely away from the target value. And we have acceptance criteria, which are really huge borders. But even if we are using these huge borders, like 30% of the labs fail to get the certificate in the end. Interestingly, some people are quite confident that switching to another method um, solves all the problems. And um, this is the results from mass spectrometry. It's only four laboratories. Um, it's important to mention very specialized laboratories and it was really to my surprise to see in the last I think three or four ring trials that even the mass spec laboratories do not completely agree and, and you can see it here this is an obvious outlier but also the three others are not like super imposable and um, the results for the few laboratories already using the ISIS assay are depicted here. So that's a summary. I would say a lot of confusion and um, each center really needs to know the assay which is used. Um, otherwise, you might use numbers from literature which are not related to the assays used by your laboratory. And to make it even worse, the situation for renin, and this is only renin concentration, is not much better. And if I would show you the data for the renin activity, which is still measured in a couple of laboratories, the agreement between the laboratories is even worse. As a consequence, um, there is a lot of confusion about the cutoffs to be used to make a diagnosis. 
Um, and this is in a certain sense also reflected in the endocrine society guidelines. There's a clear statement that there is too much variability between the assays and on top of that um, the literature gives us another important or difficult task to solve. All the analytes are reported in different units. Some of the laboratories are using mass units, others are reporting in, in nanogram. Um, for renin we have the activity measurements and the concentration measurements and for the concentration of renin some laboratories report in units and others in nanogram. So the endocrine society guidelines provide you with this set of um, cutoff values to be used um, and this does not even reflect the assay variability. It is just different units and different measurements, activity and concentration. So it's really confusing and my bottom line is we definitely need a clear set of method specific cutoff values otherwise you get completely lost. Good. Um, having this in mind it is um, clear that the first thing we were, we were interested in is uh, to, to investigate the correlation of the new assays to those uh, which already exist and um, on the left side you can see the measurement of some of the uh, uh, samples from the external quality assessment scheme um, by the German Reference Institute for Bioanalytics compared to a measurement using the IDS ISIS system. The correlation in these samples was comparably good. Um, we also compared the, or different laboratories provided the data. One lab in Vienna, Austria, compared the ISIS to the Siemens radio immunoassay. The results were, let's say, comparable, but as you can see, the scatter is huge. Um, and the results, the comparison to, to the diasorin aldosterone assay, which was done in Australia, showed again some kind of a correlation, but definitely much um, higher values obtained by the diasorin method. Um, in our laboratory in Munich, we analyzed a huge set of samples, um, compared the um, ISIS and the diasorin instrument, a new, um, um, or the new renin assay and the diasorin renin assay. Um, and again, the same uh, picture, uh, we have some kind of a correlation, but the, there is a huge scatter between the methods. And um, some groups also did a comparison with plasma renin activity. And again, to my surprise, in this case, the correlation was really um, good. So uh, I would assume that the renin concentration measured by this assay, in a certain sense, reflects plasma renin activity. Um, the clinical validation of the new assays, and um, I want to show you data we obtained in, in cohorts from our CONS registry. Um, the patients included and also the controls included all underwent the same um, 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 investigations. Uh, we have traditionally, we are using a cutoff of 1.2 using the Siemens aldosterone and the renin assay on the diasorin instrument. Uh, we exclude beta blockers, MRAs and hypokalemia in our patients is always corrected before the measurement is done. Um, in 90% of the cases it's possible to, to exclude the diuretics, in some patients it's not possible to switch the medication. Um, and if we have a positive aldosterone to renin ratio, then we continue with the salon load and our cutoff is 5 nanogram per deciliter with the um, Siemens assay. Um, finally, we are doing um, adrenal vein sampling in the majority of patients to confirm or to exclude lateralization. And um, the essential hypertensives are the patients which underwent this uh, procedure but 
turned out to be negative and other causes of um, hypertension were also excluded. Okay, this is the data. We have 138 patients with confirmed primary aldosteronism, 321 essential hypertensives and 130 healthy controls. That's the first point I want to, to make. It's important if you are talking about the discriminatory potency of the um, aldosterone to renin ratio um, to, to keep in mind the group to which it is compared. It's easier to discriminate PA from a normal population than from essential hypertensives and that's something which you clearly can see the um, aldosterone to renin ratio tends to be higher in the essential hypertensives. But still, there's a comparably good discrimination from the patients with primary aldosteronism. And the red line is our traditional cutoff, uh, which was established with different methods. And if we turn to a rock analysis to obtain the optimum sensitivity and specificity, turns out that um, it is if you want to. Um, um, find out all the patients with primary aldosteronism, you have to lower the cutoff. Of course, at the risk of slightly increased number of false positives, which undergo cell line load, but screening for me means I want to get all the affected subjects, so I would recommend to lower the cutoff um, for these methods to a value of 0.9 if we are talking in um, nanogram per deciliter divided by milliunits per milliliter. Okay, oops, wrong direction. Okay, some um, brief uh, uh, informations about the confirmatory test. First, I know there are several confirmatory tests being conducted by different centers. In the German CONS registry, we almost exclusively rely on the um, IV salt load. So all the data we have um, are from salt load testing. Um, a couple of years ago we, we looked at different aldosterone assays, um, the performance in salt load um, testing and what we observed in this study again refers to the method variability. Depending on the assay you are using you get completely different numbers for aldosterone so you have to use assay specific cutoffs and um, if you look at the correlation between the methods um, you also can see that even if two methods correlate it does not mean they agree um, this was the correlation between um, our um, reference method and the adultus method or the DSL method and um, if you do a blend Altman plot, which basically means you plot the mean of both methods against the difference. You easily can see that um, there is a calibration issue because we have a systematic overestimation of aldosterone by most methods. And we also have sensitivity issues because the agreement between the methods gets worse in the lower concentration range. This was also true with um, for comparison with the Nichols method. Apparently the calibration was similar for both assays, but again, we have considerable um, um, variability, especially at the low end. And my take home mes message is really, correlation does not mean methods agree. And I, um, I am really not in favor of using conversion factors between assays. So you have to establish your method-specific cutoffs. And that's what we did for um, the new IDS ISIS aldosterone assay salt load um, in the patients from the CONS registry. The number is 50 and we had um, 78 controls. And um, as you can see, the traditional cutoff of five um, turned out to be in the range we also uh, can use um, for the new IDS aldosterone assay. Although, of course, you have a couple of cases 
which you might not classify the same way when you switch the method. Okay, to, to uh, summarize, um, screening for primary aldosteronism really is needed and um, the gold standard or the standard protocol we are following is aldosterone to renin ratio and then in a positive case confirmatory test which um, in most cases is the salt load test. Um, the method dependent concentrations remain a problem so be cautious when using cutoffs from the literature. That's really um, misleading in many cases. For the um, two new assays, we have shown acceptable correlation to existing methods. And I refer to the next talk, which gives you more details about the comparison to a gold standard method. Um, the automated the availability of an automated aldosterone and renin measurement measurement of course facilitates a broader screening for this disease and the cutoffs for the ratio um, we found for this specific method combination is 0.9 for the aldosterone to renin ratio please be careful it's 0.9 only if reporting in these units um, and um, the salt load test, for the time being, we stay with the cutoff we had of below 5 nanogram, excluding uh, hyperaldosteronism. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jason, do you want to guide discussion? <laughs> Any questions for anybody in the audience? Uh, Why do you prefer to report renin in units per milliliter rather than nanogram per milliliter? Why do you prefer to uh, refer units, uh, in the case of reading units per milliliter rather than nanograms per milliliter is the question. Um, the answer is very easy. I accept the criticism that milliunits is um, Let's say it doesn't make us a lot of sense if we have a good calibrator which allows us to report in mass units. Um, it's a fixed conversion factor provided by the company traditionally providing the Renin assay uh, for our lab. And because of the clinical colleagues have certain numbers in mind, we didn't want to change this. But of course, it's, it's a very valid point. We should report Renin in mass units if possible.
ahead. Yeah, go ahead. What about the manager with money where many different laboratories are involved and where some of the laboratories cannot simply change methods and might further um, continue to use uh, renin, um, plasma renin activity measurements as opposed to plasma renin concentration, for example. And of course, there is no easy answer how to get rid of the confusion. My recommendation is um, if you really want to start a more widespread screening for primary aldosteronism, as a clinician, you have to talk to your lab and to make both parties aware of the potential pitfalls and problems and also you have to make clear that after there was a decision for a certain combination of methods this should not be changed every other year just for cost reasons or whatever it's important to keep the measurement strategy constant otherwise we never get rid of confusion and um, of course I only can recommend to use random concentration measurements as opposed to activity because in the broader setting it's better to standardize. I, I, I know that many centers with specialized laboratories have extreme good experience with random activity measurements which has been done there for years and for this individual center the method might work but they need their own cutoffs and their own um, um, procedures and it's very difficult to compare those um, individual laboratories and centers to the broad let's say field of different GPs sending samples to different laboratories in this case measurement of random concentration certainly provides advantages I would just add one minor detail. Uh, plasma renin activity is very, very labor intensive. Okay? And there is a tremendous variability because there is a lot of things that have to be controlled, which unfortunately with a renin concentration minimizes that without being perfect. So I'm just uh, delighted to be here and very thankful to Amina Diagnostic System for inviting me um, and uh, to, to be listed behind uh, and to follow these two gentlemen, Dr. Gomez Sanchez, Dr. Bittemar, um, it makes me feel small but a little bigger because it's a great opportunity for me. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Dan Holmes. I'm, uh, I'm a clinical pathologist at the University of British Columbia and um, uh, practice at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about a comparison of the IBS ISIS against LC10 MMS and some of our experiences with adrenal vein sampling with, with specific case example. We're a 500 bed hospital in downtown Vancouver. And uh, if you didn't know where Vancouver was, you probably do after the Olympics. Our hospital uh, specializes in nephrology, renal transplant, cardiac care, cardiac transplant, HIV, we have a large HIV positive population, cardiopulmonary research and endocrinology. That's our hospital, it is the oldest hospital in Vancouver and it shows, if you ever come inside, as Dr. Gomez Sanchez has done, it's, it's a little dingy but we have a lot of spirit and we say that God is on our side. And you can just see St. Paul, there he is right there. At St. Paul, if you get up close. So, just to explain, because people might not be familiar with the technique of LC tandem MS, and that stands for liquid chromatography and tandem mass spectrometry, and that means that there's two mass spectrometry steps back to back, and that's why they call it tandem MS, and that's sometimes shortened to TMS. And what tandem MS is, is a way of counting ions of a particular molecular weight. That's essentially what it comes down to. And if you choose your molecular weight carefully, you can tell what compound you're looking at. Now, believe it or not, aldosterone has a molecular weight of 360 grams per mole. There's a lot of compounds in your blood that weigh 360 grams per mole. A lot of compounds. So separating just based on the molecular weight is not good enough. 
what we have to do first is do high performance liquid chromatography out front. And that'll get us a little window of compounds with the same chromatographic behavior, the same chemical, physical, physical chemical behavior, and then we put them into the mass spectrometer to choose that molecular weight, but that's not good enough either. Because there are a whole bunch of compounds that have the same physical chemical properties that all weigh 360 grams per mole. So we have another step, and that's where the tandem part of tandem S in comes in, and we fragment the molecule, and we separate based on the fragmentation pattern of the molecule, and that's not good enough sometimes. And I'll tell you the context in which it is not good enough. The footprint, this is not our LCMS system because when we don't use tanked nitrogen, we use a nitrogen generator. But this is the same setup that we use. We use all of this data was generated on an ABCIX API 5000 system with Shimadzu LC out front. And there's also a gas generator, which is hot and makes a lot of noise. But on cold days, you can cozy up to the vent pipe and hug it, and it's warm. And everybody in our lab does that. Uh, this, the footprint of an LC tandem MS system is substantial, and I'll be talking about other advantages and disadvantages of an LC MS system. So I want to show you how they work, essentially. What you don't see is the HPLC system that sits out front, and uh, what that does is separate on the basis of the, you know, of the polarity of molecules that are in the sample. So the first thing that happens is we take the human sample and we add ether. It's a particular kind of ether that's not as flammable as traditional diethyl ether that you use as a lock de-icer. We use something called methyl terbutyl ether, which has a lower vapor pressure and a, a, a higher flash point. So it's a little safer, but it still stinks. But when you work in a chemistry lab, you start to kind of like the smell of some solvents. Um, maybe it's just that the solvents are getting to us. In any case, we put two mils of this MTBE over the sample and we vortex it for a few minutes and then we let it settle down and we aspirate some of that MTBE and we put it into a 96 well plate on a pipetting robot and then we dry that down under, under uh, um, air from the hospital system and then we reconstitute it with methanol and water solution injected into the mass spectrometer. It goes through the HPLC system and then it comes into the electrospray probe. And what the electrostate probe does is it's charged to 5,000 volts. I suppose that's why they call it the API 5000. And it picks up charge. In, in the case of aldosterone, it's picking up negative charge. We run it in negative ion mode. This, is, this diagram is set up for positive. But it picks up negative charge as it comes off. On the, and this, the negative charge is deposit on the solvent droplets. But we have two hot jets running in there. And they dry up the solvent droplets. And the solvent blows off. And eventually, the charge gets too concentrated, and the coulombic forces cause the little droplets to explode, and then they dry down and explode, and they dry down and explode, and eventually all you have left are charged ions. The charged ions get drawn into the mass spectrometer by two forces. One is the, the major force is, of course, the uh, electrostatic force, but the, the second thing is that there's a vacuum orifice here, and they come into the mass analyzer. And in the mass analyzer, they're coming in as charged entities, and they come through mass filter one, number one, and we're going to select for the molecular weight of aldosterone at the first mass filter. And then they come into what's called the collision cell, with, where a little bit of nitrogen is introduced, and that causes the molecules to smash, the ions to smash against the nitrogen, and they fragment. And then we look for a second mass that is specific to aldosterone, and then we detect that second mass at the detector. But lots of things will interfere with this. There are compounds that are very similar in physical chemical properties and fragmentation pattern to aldosterone. And in fact, um, some of the serum separator tubes, the gel separator tubes, will, will cause interference with that also. We actually look at two different molecular weights of fragment ion, and we, we, um, we use that to, uh, to, as a quality assurance that we get the same concentration using two different fragments. If we see a difference in the concentration between the two fragments, we can run a different chromatographic method to try and separate out the interference, or we can report the lower of the two values, which is what we usually do, because most of the time when we see an interference, it's due to Becton Dickinson gel separator tubes, or their PST tubes. So what about some pros and cons of LCMS? Well, from a consumable standpoint, LCMS is very inexpensive, and that's the reason that the major diagnostic laboratories in the United States, like Quest and LabCorp and ARUP, use LCMS to detect small molecules, because once you've got it rolling, it's very inexpensive to run. It's not as subject to interferences, but I would want no one to ever believe that LCMS does not have interferences. You'll hear people say, well, LCMS is free of interferences. That is total and utter nonsense, and I can show you lots of examples. I can show you one from last week on a cortisol specimen that had prednisolone in it, that this is not the case. 
There are lots of interferences in LC10-MMS, particularly if you do a poor method development and you don't test for interferences. So if you do a poor job with your chromatography, which you might do if you're inexperienced, you might have a method that has all kinds of interferences in it. Um, in theory, LCMS can be an absolute reference method, although there is no absolute reference method published by the Center for Disease Control for aldosterone. They are working on one. You don't get as much lot-to-lot -lot variability when you make your own calibrators and you store them for years, although they can deteriorate and it's your responsibility to make sure they're not deteriorating. And we have a limit of quantitation around one nanogram per deciliter or 30 picomol per liter. However, and this is a big however, particularly in, the, in, in Canada where we have um, um, uh, socialized medicine and, and in the United States where there are obviously cost pressures also, you have about a $500,000 upfront cost for your instrumentation. It's technically far more demanding. Uh, it's not the kind of work that you can take a standard MLT and drop them in to do. You really need to have a dedicated assay LCMS person, and that's what we have. Grace van der Gukten, who did all of our assay development for LCMS, is sitting in the second row. And she, she is, she's been working as a con in a contract research organization for five or six years before she came to us doing small molecule assay development. Uh, so you can't do your assay development necessarily with medical lab techs. Your HPLC clogs, I can assure you, uh, it, the gas generator and, uh, and the vacuum pumps can be loud and it can be hot, but Vancouver can be cold, so sometimes we like the fact that the LCMS is hot and sometimes we don't like it. You have to generate nitrogen all the time. You can have it in doers or you can have a nitrogen generator. An individual peak review of all peaks is mandatory. You have to look at the chromat chromatography. If you don't look at the chromatography, you don't see that there are interferences. Obviously, you don't have to do that with an immunoassay because you can't. Um, but when you can increase your quality, you have to increase your quality. That's the way quality works. And so individual peak review is mandatory. Service contracts for instruments are typically 10% of their market value. So the service contract on an LCMS system is about is $50,000 a year. With the IDS ISIS or other immunoassay systems, the startup costs are quite a bit less, less than $100,000. Obviously, I can't give you a specifics about that, but I can, we have an IDS ISIS to do IGF-1, which we're very pleased about, and the um, cost for us was below $100,000. Uh, this is a fully automated aldosterone method. It affords, this is a big thing, it affords the closure of radioimmunoassay labs, um, which, which uh, there's a lot of pressure to do. I don't know whether it's like this in the United States, but in Canada, the regulations around writing a radioimmunoassay lab have become really irritating, and a lot of paperwork and a lot of frustration. A comparable sensitivity to RIA, um, which was partially shown, and I'll show you some more, and obviously the footprint of the instrument is a lot smaller than a tandem system. Um, but the high, there's higher consumables cost on IDS ISIS and it would only make sense to do it by mass spectrometry if you had the throughput, the volume to do it and, and, um, and, the, and the cost pressures uh, weren't there for the instrument purchase. The LOQ of the, of the ISIS for aldosterone is a little higher at 3.7 or 100 picomol per liter but that's below the 5 nanogram per deciliter cutoff for uh, post saline suppression so really an aldosterone assay needs to be able to get down to about 100 picomol per liter or, or three, four nanogram per deciliter, which is where this gets. I, if the LOQ is 140 picomol per liter, five nanogram per deciliter, you'd have a problem. So our, our uh, plan was to, or our, our goal here was to, to compare the IDS ISIS aldosterone method to LC10MMS and to look at uh, the comparison of the aldosterone to renin ratio in both systems. So we took 77 plasma specimens, which were collected from the outpatient primary aldosteronism screening at St. Paul's Hospital, which functions largely is the screening program for the province, although one private lab does, um, does some screening also. And we did not select them randomly. We took them so that the aldosterone results would span the normal range. That would give us better regression information than if we just selected random specimens. So I wouldn't want you to think these are randomly selected. We performed LCMS on them, and then we selected them to span the linear range. I, I want to make this point. We did not censor the specimens for CKD. Now, this might not make any chronic kidney disease, that is. This might not make any sense to you, but the, the reason I point that out specifically is because chronic kidney disease causes interference in, in um, homogeneous immunoassays. So all, in, all modern immunoassays are homogeneous, or that is one step, one pot immunoassays. And uh, people with chronic kidney disease accumulate aldosterone metabolites, and so they get, can get spurious elevation of aldosterone. And uh, so we did not censor the specimens for CKD, although we, we, we did when we compared with the Siemens assay. 
So aldosterone was determined by LC10 MS with the method that Grace developed. Plasma renin activity was, was performed by the method of Poulsen and Jorgensen, which is at pH 6 point, uh, sorry, 7.4, not pH 6.0. So just to add to the confusion that's out there, you get plasma renin activity results that are exactly half what you would get if you use pH 6, which commercial methods do. Specimens were analyzed at our lab, and then they were um, sent uh, by courier to Bolden. So they did go through a freeze-thaw cycle. Just to assure you that we are measuring aldosterone at our lab, this is a comparison between our laboratory, St. Paul's Hospital on the x-axis, and um, uh, La Laboratory Corporation on the y La Laboratory Corporation of America on the y-axis. Uh, Russell Grant and I did this comparison with one another. So this is uh, quite a tight correlation. I do want to point out, however, um, depends on who's, I sent them our calibrators and they had their own calibrators. This comparison is, um, is performed using um, our calibrators. So when we compared our calibration versus their calibration, even though we were purchasing from the same commercial calibration source, uh, we had a, about a 10% or 8% bias that was introduced by calibration. That's something to do with the weighing or the lot of the aldosterone calibrator, what have you. In any case, if you go onto the same calibrator, you get a very tight correlation. So, This is our comparison with the IDS ISIS on the y-axis and uh, LCMS on the uh, x-axis and plasma results with no censorship for chronic kidney disease. I was actually really surprised. <laughs> um, we got a, a little bias of about 8% there we can see, but a, a, an R squared of 0.93 for biological assay is, uh, is pretty good. You notice that I did the IDS ISIS color scheme? I just thought I'd point that out. Um, now let's, look, let's make it a little harder. Let's look below 20 nanogram per DL or 550 picomole per liter. Why do I pick that? Well, because that, that's kind of where you find the more subtle cases of primary aldosterone somewhere between 300 picomole per liter and 500 picomole per liter. In other words, in the normal range, but in the upper half of the normal range. And we also, we don't have a bad comparison there too. We still have a little bit of bias, but we have a, a good correlation coefficient, R squared of 0.93 again. And um, so that, that, that's pretty good. And so we go right down to about five nanogram per deciliter. What we haven't done is explore this region, uh, what the comparison would look like post saline. So we repeated the experiment, actually we repeated the experiment a number of ways in urine and I'm not going to show all the different things we did in urine, but we took a hundred discarded anonymized urine specimens randomly selected and truly randomly selected from our inpatient urinalysis population, not for screening and hypertension, just all comers. Urine aldosterone was performed by LC tanum MS by after overnight acid hydrolysis according to the method that Siemens recommends for the Siemens code account method. Likewise, the urines were exposed to the Siemens code account RIA um, sample prep method in Bolden and we compared those. So I'm comparing identical um, sample preps followed by uh, LCMS or rating um, uh, immunoassay analysis. So we got one outlier that's hurting our correlation coefficient, but I thought, you know, in this, in, for the sake of honesty, I would leave the outlier in. This is a much better number if we take that outlier out, but this is our regression comparison. You can see that that's another good correlation and we were happy with that. And now, this is the most important part. Um, we wanted to get a preliminary feel for how the aldosterone renin ratio compared between using our site, which is the LCMS plus rate immunoassay, compared to um, an entirely ISIS uh, uh, aldosterone to renin ratio. We took 34 as discarded anonymized EDTA plasma specimens from our program. We performed plasma renin activity by RIA and compared it with plasma renin mass on the ISIS and looked at the aldosterone renin ratio of the two approaches. I want to point out that we independently developed our thresholds for aldosterone renin ratio entirely independently. So we did our own work years and years ago where we established our thresholds and then Dr. Bildenmeier of course was the one who was doing the thresholds for uh, the data here. Now this is the comparison of plasma renin activity and plasma renin mass. You saw this earlier. Correlation is, is a bit scattered, of course, um, uh, but this is the domain that we care about. Again, emphasizing the fact that units are different everywhere. We have our own personal units that no one on planet Earth uses that I didn't set up, nanogram per liter per second. And so what we found, um, I'll just tell you how we report at St. Paul's Hospital. 
If you're less than 15 nanogram per deciliter per nanogram per ml per hour, that constitutes a negative. Indeterminate is 15 to 25, and greater than 25 is considered a positive. Just multiply by 100, those who are from Royal Columbian Hospital, to convert it to what we're actually using and reporting in. And in Bolden, when, at the time we did this analysis, we were going to use that threshold of one that was mentioned earlier. Um, that less than one would be a negative, and I, actually, this should be read greater than 1.0 should be a positive. Excuse me, that should be greater than 1.0, not greater than 1.10. And we excluded one hemolyzed specimen because we couldn't get a plasmarine in activity on it. And at St. Paul's, we had 13 positive specimens, three indeterminate. And at Bolden, they had 16 positives because they don't use a gray zone. These, these indeterminates are in a gray zone, but they get flagged. So the, the report says that this is a maybe of primary aldosteronism. Ultimately, 32 out of the 33 specimens were concordant for clinical flagging. That is, at our site, they either got a, an overt positive or they got a flag that said this is a maybe positive. Um, and at Bolden, they got an overt positive. So we had one discordant specimen. But with this threshold of 0.9 that Dr. Bildenmeyer, Bildenmeyer just mentioned, things might be a little different. I haven't looked at that. So, is IDS better, ISIS better than your RIA? Well, I don't know because we haven't done this study formally, but this is the data we got when we compared to, the, I, to our LCMS method to the Siemens code account method. And I did not um, censor this for CKD either. Um, I did in the publication, but I didn't here. These data points that are outliers were all people with, uh, with G EGFRs less than 60. Every time I went to these outliers, I would find that they had an EGFR less than 60. So what I did is I subsequently took patients who had CKD and I performed rate immunoassay and did LCMS also. And in pe people with established diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, the aldosterone that we got from Siemens code account was twofold what we got from LC TANMS. However, overall, we have a slope of 0.9 and a correlation coefficient of 0.77. So on the face of it, it looks like ISIS is comparing a little bit better than, uh, than LC TANMS. Uh, sorry, ISIS is performing a little bit better than RIA against LC TANMS, but the, we won't know until we you know, take a cohort and measure it all three ways all at once. So I want to talk a little bit about our experience with adrenal vein sampling, how it's done, how we've gone from a site, from a site that's been wildly unsuccessful at doing adrenal vein sampling to a place where we're getting almost all of our adrenal vein samples are successfully cannulated and we're doing about one a week, although last week we did four and the, then we had none for a week and this week we did two. So we're, we're getting a lot of cases and uh, I'm going to talk to you about how we accomplished going from, uh, well I won't say zero to hero, but zero then to better than a loser. Um, this is the anatomy of the inferior vena cava and as you may know, the uh, the left adrenal vein inserts directly into the left renal vein and that makes it actually quite easy to find. You put the cannula into the left renal vein and you flip it up and it just pops into the left adrenal vein. So no radiologist has trouble getting into the left adrenal vein. The right adrenal vein is a different story. You see, this is like going down a hallway with a whole bunch of doors and you're supposed to pick the door with the prize behind it, not the goat behind it. But as you can see, this little tiny vein, which is actually smaller than the left adrenal vein, inserts directly into the IVC along with a whole bunch of other veins, some of which are draining directly from the liver. And I know they're draining directly from the liver because sometimes there's no aldosterone in the sample at all because, the, because they try to get into the right adrenal vein and they actually get a little hepatic venule and the, 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 the liver is very efficient at removing aldosterone and all the aldosterone is gone, but the cortisol is still there. So when I started out as a staff person, I thought, what are they getting? Are they getting saline in the sample? And so I accused the radiologist of contaminating with saline or contaminating with contrast. And what the radiologist was doing was cannulating the hepatic, a little hepatic venule. So that's why the right adrenal vein is difficult to cannulate. And when I started at St. Paul's Hospital in 2006, we were doing all the adrenal vein sampling analysis for our catchment of 4 million people. And we had a 33% success rate provincially for cannulation of the right adrenal vein. So that means that 70% of the procedures were awash, and if you take into account the whole diagnostic process, the radiology suite, the nurses, the, radi the radiologist, him or herself, the analysis in the lab, handling of mislabeled specimens and all that jazz and all the dilutions we had to do, you know, I figure you're probably somewhere in the $5,000 range, and I know that in the United States, $15,000 is the remuneration in some states for this procedure. That's a lot of wasted money. 
So the first and simplest thing that we did to improve cannulation success for adrenal vein sampling is give the report to the radiologist. Physically hand the report to the radiologist, no matter where they were, we mailed it to them with a letter giving the interpretation. And just that process of informing the radiologist who never knew that they were not successful, just that process of informing them raised our success rate provincially to around 70%. But it gets better. So we were frustrated and we did a retrospective review of 224 adrenal vein sampling procedures on 198 unique patients because some people get duplicate procedures because they fail. And we found some very interesting things. Um, the sites, we, we did it with and without ACTH stimulation. And I know there are strengths and weaknesses to ACTH, which I'll mention. But the most important thing is that the hospital with one operator had a 90% cannulation success rate. But the hospital with a whole bunch of different op, with more operators, was down at about 24% success. Now, it actually got worse over time for some hospitals and better for others. This hospital here, uh, site A, is actually now at 98% success in the last two years. And this site C is down to 11% success. And that's because the rich are getting richer and all the cases are going to David's Hospital, the Royal Columbian Hospital, which is not our hospital. Site A is not our hospital. Site A is a, is a, is a peripheral, uh, is a tertiary care center, but not right downtown. We call it a peripheral tertiary care center. Um, I can assure you that this caused irritation and frustration at, the, um, at some of the other hospitals. So my point on this slide is please make sure that one or two operators is performing this procedure in your catchment because, for the radiologist's perspective. Make sure you collaborate with your radiologist, discuss to them. Please discuss pre-labeling strategies for the tubes. Very often you get specimens that are mislabeled and that can be uh, a hazard diagnostically because this is a tumor localization procedure. Discourage multiple collections. I don't want 17 samples labeled right adrenal vein, attempt number one, attempt number two, attempt number three, attempt number four. That costs us a lot diagnostically in the lab and that increases the error on accessioning because accessioning is going to happen twice most of the time, once at the regional lab and once at the gain at the referral center. I would not accept specimens that are referred, I would not expect cortisol result, accept cortisol results referred in from another center. There's too much room for transcription error and there's too much room for dilution error. I would do them yourself. I would run your specimens neat and at two higher dilutions, either 50 and 100 or 40 and 80 or something like that, you have to run at multiple dilutions because you have, to, you have to find results that fall in the linear range. With adrenal vein samples, you're talking about concentrations of 100 to 100,000 to half a million picomolar, so huge concentrations. You want to compare the same full dilution bilaterally because you get non-linearity effects. So if the right is diluted 50-fold to get a number, it'd be nice if you could compare it to the left diluted 50-fold and compare those two numbers. And we suggest the collection, and this is not a mandatory, but it's helpful. We suggest the collection of left, right, and inferior vena cava cess specimens pre and then post 250 microgram ACTH. Uh, and then we do another collection 10 minutes later. Make sure you don't turn off your brain. Make sure that your cortisol results before the ACTH administration are lower than your cortisol results after the ACTH administration, or somebody has mixed up the specimens. Um, the same is true for aldosterone, because aldosterone is quite ACTH responsive. Don't attempt to interpret results if only one side is catheterized. Don't look at the results from the right and say, oh, I'm getting huge numbers because even the unaffected gland continues to make a lot of aldosterone in Kahn syndrome, unlike Cushing's, because the unaffected gland is still under ACTH stimulation, even though it's not under plasma renin activity stimulation or angiotensin II stimulation. And as I mentioned, if the aldosterone concentration is lower than the IVC from that right adrenal vein, you've successfully cannulated the liver. So how do we interpret them? The first thing we do is, are we successfully cannulated? And we do that with cortisol determination. And the second thing we do is calculate aldosterone to uh, cortisol ratios for the left and right. And we divide the larger ratio by the smaller ratio. And we look at that number ratio of ratios, which we call the lateralization index. What constitutes a lateralized lateralization index is a matter of much controversy in the literature. 
we happen to use William F. Young's recommendation that greater than four is lateralized, less than three is not lateralized, and indeterminate is from three to four. This is a real case, also from the Royal Columbian Hospital of Mr. R. This is when we were using rate immune assay, which is why we're reporting with the greater than sign. We no longer do that because we, we have a wider dynamic range now. In any case, our first question is, have we successfully cannulated the adrenal veins? And the way we answer that is by looking at the cortisols. Are they much higher than the inferior vena cava? You can see in this before ACTH administration, these two cortisol results are more than twofold of the IVC. And post ACTH stimulation, you can definitely see they're much, much higher. And that's why we use it, because it exaggerates the cortisol production and helps you to tell that you have successfully cannulated. Now we divide all aldosterone concentrations by cortisol concentrations, and we take the ratio of ratios. And so the left has the larger ratio of aldosterone to cortisol, and we divide the left by the right, and we get a ratio of greater than seven in the pre-ACTH phase, and greater than 11 in the post, or greater than 10 in the post-ACTH phase. And that tells us that Mr. R has a left cons adenoma. Oh, I forgot I had those nice little animations in there. Too bad. Okay, this is an area of controversy. This is my opinion about this area of controversy. After reviewing these 224 cases, we discovered that 36 of those procedures were completely salvaged from non-interpretability by ACTH. Because in the post-ACTH phase, we could see that the, that the cannula were into the adrenal veins and we could proceed with the calculation. However, uh, so, now, so this is, this is the, the good side of using ACTH. This is the selectivity index. It's the ratio of the adrenal cortisol to the inferior vena cava, cava cortisol. And what you can see is that the administration of ACTH exaggerates the cortisol production. No surprise there. That's good. That's helpful to us. Here's the bad side of ACTH. ACTH stimulates the unaffected gland. So we have a cons adenoma on the right, and we have just an adrenal sitting on the left, and we give ACTH, and the adrenal on the left says, hey, I gotta make a lot more aldosterone and cortisol. And then the extent of lateralization, the, ex the disparity between the right and the left just diminishes when you give ACTH. Now, you'll still save people having to have repeat procedures, but you must interpret with this in mind. If you, if you only look at the post-ACTH specimens, you are going to miss some cases of Kahn syndrome. You want to give the post-ACTH specimens less credence. However, if the post-ACTH specimens still show lateralization, then you're golden because you, you may not have had data from the pre-ACTH specimens. That's just my opinion. Some sites approach this differently. They do rapid cortisol assay. But we, we use ACTH with the knowledge of the danger that it might cause us to incorrectly declare lot, um, a bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. And, and we, did see, we did see that. We had 44 cases that were lateralized and successfully cannulated in the pre and post ACTH phases. And 13 of those cases uh, delateralized when you gave them ACTH. So a third of your cases will delateralize on you. And that, that that has risks associated with it. However, we identified a whole bunch of cons adenomas based on the post-ACTH data, where, and those patients had no pre-ACTH data because there was no evidence of cannulation. So that's, it's a cost and it's a benefit. In any case, on to conclusions. For plasma and urine aldosterone, IDS Isis represents a good solution and a way to migrate away from RIA. It's totally automated, which saves time, of course. And our initial evaluation based on screening fared well against our long established uh, approach um, that uh, where we established our cutoffs probably in the 80s or early 90s. And that is the footprint of the IDS ISIS. I should have parked myself beside it so you can get a feel for it. It's about half the length of the mass spectrometer and it has no HPLC attached to it. And now I'll open the floor. I just want to give um, some, some acknowledgements though. Uh, Grace Vandergutten developed our assays. She actually did all of the technical and analytical work. She did all of the analyses for the, the plasma, all the analyses for the urine, and she deserves the credit for all the stuff that I get to stand in front of people and talk about. I'm just the talking head. Grace does all the work down below, so Grace needs to be acknowledged. Um, and now I'll open the floor to questions.
don't all jump in and ask questions. This is that awkward point where the chairman asks a question. Oh, there's a question from the chairman. <laughs> the other chairman. <laughs> Okay, that's an excellent question. So the, the question has been asked to me, you do pre and post ACTH cannulation of the adrenal veins. Well, we don't cannulate them twice, we actually leave the cannula in place and tell the patient to chill out for 10 minutes. Um, so it does extend the process for sure. But if even if you do, a, so, so we give the ACTH and we wait 10 minutes and we do a recollect. That's an extension, but if you do use rapid cortisol assay, you're looking at a 10 minute or a 15 minute delay also. So there's no, there's no um, massive advantage. What do you mean? You leave the cannulation? We leave, okay, so I, I should be more clear. There are two cannula. This radiologist who's so good puts two cannula in simultaneously and leaves them in situ during the ACTH stimulation. So that, that's how that's accomplished. And on the way out, collects the inferior cavernous vein. That's correct. But he would, if he was going to draw a cannula out, he would draw it from the left and then put it back in the left because that's way easier to do. I would caution you as your clinician to tell your radiologist to collect the right side first. The radiologist might want to do the left side, but we'll do the easy one first and then we'll do the hard one. The problem with that is they do the easy one first and then two and a half hours later, and I say two and a half hours later, I'm not joking, two and a half hours later when they get into the right, because that did happen to a patient who phoned me very angry. I said, oh, I didn't, I'm just the lab guy. Um, you, you got a big delay, a lot of agitation, a lot of ACTH stimulation, you wouldn't want that to be the case. Any other questions? What is your turnaround in the number of samples per day when you're doing an aldosterone by mass spec? So um, that's a great question. What's our turnaround? How do, we, how do we measure aldosterone? What's our turnaround time? We batch it, we run on Wednesdays. So we don't turn the results around the same day. We, ba we batch them and run them Wednesdays. So our cycle time for our aldosterone method is 10 minutes, and so we, we I guess we, typically we're doing a plate and a quarter, or a plate and a half, with 96 well plate and a half. And so we're prepping the samples in the morning, we're drying them down around lunch, we're reconstituting, we're loading them on the analyzer at 2 p.m., something like that, and the analyzer will run all night. Now we have had occurrences where the analyzer froze up in the middle of the night because of the clog in the HPLC system, and then we needed to, uh, to reshoot them the following afternoon. We have to reshoot the calibrators too when we do something like that. But uh, we're one week turnaround time. But then we're taking specimens from the whole province. So, and you know, it's not like, you know, my patient's on the table and I need to operate now. So, any other questions? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. And thank you for attending.